们下一场是请到 Andres 呃 m i r a 呃，他基本上是我们的呃 Java Champion， 他同时是 Java Champion， 也是 Apache 的 PNC。那其实这两个都不容易，所以我们好不容易特别邀请到他。那其实就他，他本身是在瑞士 Sweden， 那他早上那边是八点多，所以其实我们这次也很感激他能这么早起特别来参与我们的现场议程。那也希望大家好，就此开始，那给另外呃 ，Andrew 一个一个热烈的掌声，然后开，然后我们就可以让他开场。Hello everybody, um, it's it's so great to to be able to see you uh through the screen. Although I would really prefer to be in person with you, but I guess that we'll have to wait for another year. I'm streaming directly from Switzerland. I hope that、uh, you have had so far a very good day at the conference. It's early in the morning for me. You have had already a couple of hours enjoying content, so I also hope that you will continue to enjoy the rest of the content that we have for you today.、Um, as you have seen、uh, today, the topic that I have for you is、uh, Groovy Meta Programming, and I'm going to share my second screen. Okay, so、um, I will expect that well, most of you are Java developers, and、uh, you may be aware that quite a good number of alternative JVM、uh, languages out there, and Groovy being one of them. And today, I want to showcase、um, one of the features that I found that have been very useful for a Java developer、uh, to complement their daily work with with Groovy. So my name is Andrew Samurai. I'm、um, I work currently for Oracle. I'm, I'm a Java champion alumni, and I'm a member of the Apache Group of PMC. That means that I'm a member of the team of people that、um, that develop、uh, Groovy. And、uh, I'm also a member and a founder of Hacker Garden, which is an it's kind of an organization, a group of people that just work on open source projects just because we want it, and、um, and we help the, the、uh, make the world a better place just by making one commit at a time. And、uh, in I think it was a little bit more than a month ago that the Groovy project made two releases: the last stable release of version three X. Uh, which is three zero six, and、uh, the first alpha release of four zero, and then four zero perhaps is going to be the the release that will be most helpful to you as a Java developer, and you will see in a moment why. Now we highly encourage you, if you are already a Groovy user, to download any of these releases and and use them and give us any feedback, specifically. For version four, because in version four there will be a binary breakage. The reason being is that if you follow a little bit of the history of the project and the language, we moved to Apache five years ago, but we still kept the old package names、uh, from Codehouse. But starting with version four, we are moving all of our packages to under the Org Apache Groovy. But we're also going to modularize the language using the Java modules and a few other things. So this is why we're we're breaking binary compatibility. Anyway, you might have heard the term meta programming. So meta programming is basically a way for a program written in any language that supports meta programming. To be able to change or modify itself, or treat code as if it were part of data. So basically, what you can do with meta programming is,、uh, in terms of, of Java or Groovy, you can add new properties or remove properties, getters and setters. You can create classes out of thin air from, from just magically they will appear. You can add remove methods, whether they're instance methods or static methods. So Groovy offers two variants of meta programming. We have the runtime meta programming and the compile time meta programming. And if you're familiar with metrics, we use runtime for we use Blue for runtime because you stay in Wonderland. As long as you use Groovy as your main language or you run Groovy, then you have the capabilities accessible to you at runtime. But On the other hand, if you want to use Java or any other JVM language, then you go with the compile time, and、uh, this is where we can still make use of these additions yet 
in your language of choice. So we're going to start with runtime because this is the, the easiest one, this is the direct one, and is the one that you will probably encounter the most. We need to talk about the mop, but we're not talking about that particular tool that you use to clean up the, uh, the floors. We, the mop actually stands for Meta Object Protocol. And it's this feature that allows Groovy to have its dynamic capabilities. Now, Groovy was born as a dynamic language, but it also has a static compiler. So actually, you can have both ways. You can have a static compilation with static errors during compilation time, or you can have it uh, runtime errors with the dynamic classes and dynamic typing. The meta object protocol, I'm going to uh, um, simplify things a lot, but basically for every Java class and every Groovy class, you have a companion meta class. When you invoke a message, and by invoking a message, we say you're invoking a method or accessing a property, then the meta object protocol takes effect and says, hold on a second, this class that you're looking at directly, it says Java Lang string, and you want to grab, uh, you invoke the method, um, which would be lend on the Java Lang string. This says for a moment, hold on a second. Well, let's going to see if there is, where there is the meta class for a string, and if that meta class offers additional behavior that might react to the same name, lent. And if that is the case, it's going to give you that additional behavior. These modifications through the meta object protocol, because we're talking about runtime, are only visible if you're running Groovy code. So let me show you a quick example of, of how these things work. And uh, this is a typical Groovy script. And uh, you can run it in many ways. And I'm going to show you later in a simple tool where you can use to, to run this thing. And uh, if you have not seen Groovy code before, it's a little bit very similar to Java code. You can let go of semicolons. Uh, everything is public by default, so the public keyword is gone. The definition of this person, you might think, oh, that looks like a field. But actually, the compiler is aware of the Java Beans conventions. So if you inspect the generated bytecode by the compiler, you will see a getter method and a setter method. And uh, when we're looking at this person class in lines five to seven, this is where we're making use of the meta class that every class has as a companion. And with this instruction, we're, in, we're telling the person class that is now going to have a grid method. And the definition of that method, it's a closure. This kind of like looks like a Lambda expression from Java. And we use variable substitutions, uh, which are available in Groovy. And then in line nine and 10, we create an instance of the person and we invoke the grid method. Now, because of the dynamic nature of Groovy, the invocation of the grid method succeeds and the printout looks something like, hello, Groovy, my name is Alex. Now, this is great. You may be thinking, well, it's a Groovy class. Of course, uh, things are going to work because it's magic. What if we want to modify or add behavior to an existing Java class, even a core class like the Java Lang string? Well, here is the Java Lang string class, which also happens to have a meta class. We're going to add a new method called SpongeBob using the name. And what this, this class or this method is going to do is, is change the case of the input string and uh, to lowercase or uppercase. So when we invoke in line number eight, metaprogramming is fun, and we invoke the method of SpongeBob, then the result will be something like what you see in line 10. In this way, we can prove we can also modify existing Java classes, even core classes, as long as you're running Groovy code. There is another feature that I like about Groovy in terms of runtime programming, which is inspired by uh, one of the, perhaps one of the first languages and one of those languages that um, older people really love, which is Smalltalk. Uh, Groovy takes inspiration from many different languages and Smalltalk is being one of them. So Smalltalk has this feature that allows you to invoke methods uh, that are not defined. I and mean, when that is the case, instead of the program breaking down and crashing, it gives you an option to try to recover and invoke something that kind of reacts to that method. And that, this is the does not understand feature. Ruby has something similar to that, 
and uh, it's called method missing. You have to have a specific signature definition in your class. So say, for example, we have a class foo that has no properties and no methods, except for the special one called method missing that takes a name and a list of arguments. Could be an object, could be an array, whatever it is. And then look what we do. And whenever something happens, we're simply going to say, what do you mean by parameters? So in line number seven, we create a class. We're on the current so we create an instance. And then we invoke the method say that, again, the method say was never defined. So this is something like does not understand. And the printout that we get in line 10 is, what do you mean by and the parameters? So in this, we, we, this way, we can kind of have like a escape hatch. It, by any reason, we want our objects to be able to react to uh, dynamic methods like this, then we can have it. And as a matter of fact, this is one of the ways, not, no, it's not the only one, but it's one of the ways that you can define DSLs with Groovy that can react to names that are not yet defined in the language itself. So you can create your vocabulary as you go. Here is another option uh, we saw just for invoking methods. What if we want to also handle properties that are not defined in the class? So we need a method for handling the getter and another method for handling the setter. The first definition is the one that handles the setter. And the second definition in line six is the one that handles the getter. So when we create an instance of foo, and in line number 12, we print the ID property. Uh, the ID property does not exist. So we expect something like, you don't have a property name ID, which is matches with the definition. And then in line number 13, we're trying to assign a value to a property length that again does not exist. In this case, we get the second printout, can assign a length property to you because, well, I can't. So the basis for that now understand is that you have to follow a naming convention. And now these definitions could be added to a Java class. And as long as you run your Java class inside the Groovy runtime, then you get all these benefits. Here's another thing, which is called categories. Categories allows you to add methods to classes in a specific scope. Categories require um, that you follow a naming convention and uh, a signature convention. In this case, every method in that category has to be a static. They may or may not return a value. And the first argument of the method is going to be the type that will receive the addition. So in the case of our greeter class, the string type is going to have a new method called greet. And the second restriction is that categories must have a scope. The scope is given by the method use, which is uh, one of those default methods that Ruby has. When we say use in greeter, we could have said in Java greeter dot class in Groovy classes, class literals can have just the name of the class without dot class. And that's exactly what we see here. And within the context of that scope, line seven to nine is where the greeter category is available. So the Groovy string in, in Groovy, we can have strings with single quotes or double quotes. So this Groovy string now has a uh, greet method, and it works. If I attempt to invoke the greet method in line six, outside of the scope, or in line 10 or greater, outside of the scope, then I will get a runtime error. The greet method will not be available. And again, you may be thinking, oh, okay, that's great, Andres. This works because it's a Groovy class. Well, I can reuse any existing Java code that follows this structure. For example, the Apache Common Langs uh, project has many utility classes like a string utils, which defines a lot of methods that follow the same conventions. It's, they are static methods, and the first argument is going to be the type that receives the addition. So in this case, everything that a string utils exposes goes into either char sequence or a string. So one of the methods that a string utils uh, defines is a method chop. 
So when I define a student utils as a category in scope four to six, I can invoke the method chop and I get the expected result. Another interesting addition that Groovy has is that what you see right there is a comparison. I know that in Java, we're not supposed to use the double equals operator to compare uh, strings. We should use the equals method. Groovy has another feature called operator overloading. And uh, you cannot create a new operators like you can do in Scala. It's just a, a predefined set of operators. But for those that are defined, every operator matches a specific method. In the case of the equals equals operator, that matches the equals method. So if you were to inspect the bytecode that is generated by the Google compiler, this instruction in line five actually invokes the equals method for you, which is what we want. So categories follow a specific uh, design or, or idiom. Again, the methods must be static. The first type, uh, the first argument is going to be the type of the receiver. And uh, you must use the categories within a specific scope. Here we have another thing called mixins. Now, mixins can be used either based that similar to categories. So you have to have static methods. The type of the first argument will be the receiver again. You can use Groovy classes like Rita. You can use Java classes like string utils of any other. But they are not constrained by a single scope. In line number 10, we're going to say that string we're going to mix both the Rita and the string user classes. And from this point forward, in any way in our program, in our application, we can invoke methods provided by greeter and string utils on a string instances. So that's exactly what we see in lines 12 and 13. So basically, mixings are like categories where they are not limited by scopes, and they can also be applied to Groovy and Java classes. Another thing that we have are traits. Traits were added, if I'm not mistaken, around Groovy 1.8 or 1.9, so it's been a while. You can think of traits as like we can find in Java with uh, interfaces with default methods. But additionally to that, uh, traits in Ruby are also implemented using interfaces. But additional to that information, uh, traits in Ruby can have properties, so they can have states. Interfaces in Java, even in Java 9 with static methods, must be stateless but traits in Groovy can be a stateful. So what this example is saying is, let's define an interface, could be Java, could be Groovy, called name provider, with a simple method, get name. Then we define a trait that implements said interface, and because of the nature of Groovy, as we saw earlier with a person class, the definition of that is string name property has a getter and a setter, and there is a backing field. So this trait is a stateful. And then we have the definition of the class person that implements the trait, and you can implement as many traits as you want. Then we have a definition for a grid method, which is outside of the person. This is just like an every regular method. Then we create an instance of the person, and then invoke the grid method, and it just works because P, which is type person, is both a name provider and it's a with name instance because it inherits everything for all the types. Uh, so traits gave us, again, Java 8 gave us a default methods on interfaces, and in Java 9 we've got a static methods, but Groovy gives you a stateful options on top of those things. Finally, well, there are more options for runtime metaprogramming, but the last thing that I want to touch on is uh, our extension modules. Uh, if you are aware of the Kotlin language, then let me tell you right now that the macro extensions or the extensions methods that you find in Kotlin were inspired by the extension modules that Groovy provides and a few other languages as well. So extensions modules are like mixings. That is, they add more they add behavior to your classes, but they are always globally available. They're available at compile time, you can modify both Ruby and Java classes. They can provide both instance and static methods. 
and they can be type checked by the compiler. Remember that I said that Groovy also has a static compilation? Well, extension modules also participate in static compilation. And besides the, the extension module itself, which is a class, again, could be Java, could be Groovy, you need to require an additional resource, some sort of module descriptor that, uh, that instructs, instructs the compiler where to do the injections of the behavior. So let me show you an example of this. <clears throat> this is an extension that the idea is to provide an encryption based on the bcrypt uh, algorithm. This extension is defined in Java, as you can do. Well, actually, it could be Java, could be Groovy. This exact same code is actually both Java and Groovy. But let's say that it's Java code. So we have a static method. And the type of the first argument will be the receiver, so it will be a string. And what we're doing is invoking the bcrypt algorithm on the script, on the string itself. OK, not so different. Now, look at the names of the methods. Encode as bcrypt, that takes one argument, and encode as bcrypt, that takes two arguments. Remember that. Second resource, something that looks like this. In the future, this file name will change in Groovy 4, again, because we're breaking binary compatibility. We're no longer going to use our Codehouse Groovy, we're going to use our Apache Groovy. So the descriptor has at least three elements, but it can have four. The module name, which is a, module, a name that you define. It says module, but has nothing to do with Java modules. A uh, module version, which is also a number for you to control. You can use any number you want. And then I, you can have extension classes. These are classes that provide instance methods. In this case, it's our Beaker extension. If you were to have more than one extension, then just use a comma to separate the fully qualified class names. And you can also have extensions that provide static or instant uh, static methods to your classes. In this case, we don't have any, so it's empty. So once we have these two resources, how do we consume them? Well, because my extension modules are always available through the compiler, there's nothing extra that I need to define. They just need to be in the class path. And when I run my code, or when I compile my code, those additions take effect. So in line number three, we can invoke the method encode as bcrypt anywhere in my program. And because these resources are available at compile time, your IDE will give you code completion. It will give you code suggestions as well, which in some cases, depending on the IDE, may or may not happen with traits, mixings, and categories, but certainly it's going to happen with extension modules. OK, so enough of runtime. Um, uh, runtime is fun. Now let's talk about uh, compile time. Because compile time is the one that allows you, as a Java developer, to take advantage of some of these features while still writing Java code, while still using Java code. So the, the idea of compile time metaprogramming is that you generate bytecode and that you modify bytecode. You do not generate source code. Modifications that are made through compile time metaprogramming are available to Groovy code, but also to Java code. So you can compile Groovy code with AST transformations, which is what we're going to see in just a moment, and you can access that behavior from Java code. You don't have to run Groovy, you just need to compile it. And all these modifications can also be type checked by the compiler, so you get type safety. There is a question on the if Groovy Trace has binary compatibility issues. Some versions will generate for Java 6 and some versions will generate for Java 8. That might have something to do with, uh, there are two variations of the Groovy jars right now. There is one that is just standard Groovy and another one is that uses uh, JSR 292, I believe, which is in bot dynamic. We call it Groovy Indie. And um, I was not aware that there may be these uh, variations, but one thing that I know is that in Groovy 4, 
this separation of a standard Groovy and Groovy Indie will completely be gone, and there's going to be just one. So if there's still any differences between Java 6 code and Java 8 code, that would no longer be the case in Groovy 4. OK, so how can we get compile time metaprogramming working? Well, the secret sauce is AST transformations, and AST stands for abstract syntax tree, which is what the compiler uses to understand your code. There are two flavors of AST transformations, uh, local transformations and global transformations. It's likely that you have encountered local transformations before because they are quite visible. And yet, there are still other global transformations that are always in the background, and we'll see some of that in a moment. Using or consuming a local AST transformation is quite simple. Writing and producing your own AST transformations, uh, it's fun, but you have to know a few bits about the compiler APIs, the group internals, the AC hierarchy, what is a node, what is a statement, and uh, what is an expression, and a little bit of dark magic. I mean, it's not really that hard, but um, it's a little bit of extra work that needs to be done. Excuse me. So let's talk about, let's talk about local AST transformations first. You require two things. Something that identifies the entry point for the transformation, in this case, it's an interface, and the actual transformation itself. How do we do this? This is a definition of a local AST transformation that comes from Groovy Core. It's called uh, two string. And uh, <clears throat> what we're doing here in our person class, again, we have two properties, first name and last name, with getters and setters generated by the compiler. And when we apply this transformation, then we get a two string implementation out of the box that will print out the values of all the properties. Now, this is using the default conventions. There are different ways for you to generate, uh, to, to give hints to, to, to a string to generate additional code. So for example, if we want to print out the names of the fields or the names of the properties, you can do so. If you want to exclude a property from the two string, then you can also do so. And I believe you can also pass additional properties for the format but the default settings are good enough. Now, again, this is how we consume the two string. I believe that the next slide is showing you how the two string interface is defined in Groovy Core, just like any other annotation. I mean, you have uh, the, uh, it's documented, it has retention, it has target, and has another annotation applied to it. It's called Groovy ST transformation. This is the link. This is the hint that the Groovy compiler gets to figure out whenever it encounters a two-string annotation, it will invoke the transformation class that is given as an argument in that annotation Groovy ST transformation class. So the implementation of two-string ST transformation is the one that does all the heavy lifting, which is implemented something like this. You have a class, like any other class, could be Groovy, could be Java, it extends the abstract AST transformation or implements just AST transformation interface. And you have to implement one method called visit. The, the list or array of AST nodes comprise the, the class node, or the method node, or in the thing that has been annotated. And the other thing that you have to do, and this you can see in line number one, is instruct the compiler in which phase you want your transformation to be applied. A group compiler is comprised of nine phases. Canonicalization is, I believe, is phase number, this is not four or five. I mean, the numbers doesn't matter. The important bit is that by this time, uh, all the references have been resolved, all import statements have been resolved, the types have been resolved. So your class is halfway done, and this is the right time for you to start making additions. And there, there's another phase after this one that we could use, but just after that, then pretty much the bytecode is done and there's no other addition. There's another uh, phase that we could use before this one, where your class is emptier 
and some things might break. So that's the reason why canonicalization is the preferred phase to perform these additions. Here's another class, another IST transformation as well, called canonical. What canonical does is a meta transformation. It will apply to a string as we saw before, but it also will apply another one called uh, equals and hash code that will generate an equals implementation for you and a hash code implementation for you. You also apply tuple constructor that will generate additional constructors for you. And uh, the implementations of a two string and equals and hash code follow the conventions laid out in Josh Block's effective Java book. So we know they're good. So if applied canonical, we get all other behavior that we see there for free. These lines we just apply to a string with the default conventions. It is as if we apply to the top of constructor as well. It is as if we have applied equals and hash code. So it works. Remember categories? Well, there is an AST transformation category. Now remember that categories require you to have static methods. If you use the category transformation, then you can use instance methods. Notice that the method no longer takes an argument as the receiver. You actually define the receiver as an argument to the transformation itself in line number one. Because it is a category, you still have to use it within a scope as we saw before. So now you know, you can define a category using the, uh, the language convention, the static methods, or you can use a transformation like this one. How many times have you tried to create an immutable class? I, I know that in Java, well, we got in Java 15 and Java 16, we're gonna get records in, in final mode. But uh, if we want to have immutable classes in Java, if you follow Josh Block's effective Java, then there's a series of rules that must be followed. It's about seven or eight rules, and they are recursive. Excuse me. But if you were to apply the add immutable transformation, it's just one line. So here we have three instances of point. Two of them have been created, point one and point two, with the same values. Because they are the same values and it's an immutable class, then they should be equal and they should have the same hash code. That's what line number 10 is testing. Then we create another point which has different values. So the equals and hash code should be different from point one or point two. And that's what line 11 is testing. If you have ever had trouble implementing the comparable interface, then sortable will give you that implementation. And it's not just that implements comparable, it also will generate a comparator for every property. So there will be a compare, I think it's ID comparator static method that gives you an instance of a comparator that uses ID. So we have two things here uh, with an ID that is different and the ID for T1 is lower than T2. Do we have to clone or copy for immutable so we can change some of the values? Uh, there are different strategies for generating the immutable. There is, I believe, a method called, I think it's copy, copy of generated by the immutable. So the instance itself won't be, uh, can, you cannot change the state, but you can create a copy of that one and doing the copying, then you can modify the contents. This is almost an exhaustive list of all the AST transformations, the local ones that are coming by default from Ruby core. You can tell there are a lot. One of my favorites is the builder AST transformation because this allows you to generate a builder class with different strategies. And uh, this is where I'm trying to say something like, I mean, you probably saw uh, immutable, canonical looks a lot like add data from Lombok. Immutable looks a lot like add value from Lombok. Add builder, well, there is an add builder annotation for Lombok. And uh, there is a history, a cross pollination with the two projects. Lombok came before uh, the Groovy ST transformation framework. 
And we took inspiration of some of the features that existed at the time. This is back in 2008, I believe, early 2008. And uh, then we added more capabilities, more transformations, and Project Longbox saw what Google was doing and said, ah, oh, perhaps we can provide some of those transformations as well. So we kind of have a like, feedback loop within the two projects. Of course, Longbox only works if you're using Java code, and uh, Lombok also modifies bytecode, which is something that some people like. I'm on Team Lombok, by the way, and uh, so that means that I like to use Lombok if I can. But I'm aware that also other people that do not like Lombok at all. Lombok is one of those projects that um, polarizes our community. Either you love it or you hate it. There is no middle ground. What about global C transformation? And, and we, we still have a few more minutes to go. So what we saw so far is just local. You use an, an interface to our annotation to annotate a method, a property, a field, a class, even an input statement. And uh, you get the magic. Global C transformations, on the other hand, are always available. You don't require an annotation to say, this is what I want to use my transformation. If a global transformation is available on the class path, then the Groovy compiler and the Groovy runtime will make use of that one. The, the Spock framework is seen uh, is a testing framework uh, that came out about uh, 10 years ago or so, and uh, it performs a lot of magic under the covers and is seen as a big AST transformation. So if you want to know more about uh, how to implement a big transformation like this one, then uh, we'll first have a look at the few transformation available in Ruby core, or also have a look at the Spock framework. So how do you implement a global transformation or how do you implement the AST transformation? Well, you just have to know a little bit more about compiler APIs, such as what is an expression, what is a statement, what is a class node, uh, you may use something called the ASD Builder, which is a helper class that allows you to create these expressions in three modes. You can pass a sample code as text, and the ASD Builder will generate the corresponding notes for that. <clears throat> you can pass actual Groovy code as a lambda or a closure to the ASD Builder, and it will generate the appropriate notes. Or you can use a builder node fashion. So in this case, you definitely have to know what are the expression of the statements. There is another feature called micro methods that simplifies how we generate nodes. Uh, this feature was added much more recently, I believe four or five years ago. And, uh, and of course, you can always refer to AST transforms. Now, let me show you something. I'm going to switch to the um, an utility called Groovy console is one of those utilities that comes with a standard Groovy distribution. It's a swing application. Uh, you can write code here, and when you evaluate, you get the result. Here we have that immutable class, and this will be a good test if there is a copy method or not. This is exactly the same code that was shown in the slides. All we're going to do is run this code. Our execution says complete, so there's no error. That means that this assertion is correct. And this assertion is correct. We want to make the test fail. Uh, these two should be different. And here we go. We got an assertion. The two points are different. This is another nice feature about Groovy. It's called power assertions. OK. But what I'm showing code here is because of the many options that we have, there is one thing called here in this menu, a script called the AST browser. Let's inspect the bytecode generated by the compiler. When we click here and we look into the, the passing of our class, actually there's nothing there. Uh, let's look in conversion. This is our immutable class right there. And this is the contents of our script. Nothing special. Let's move forward into canonicalization. Well, now the script remains the same, but look at our point class. The immutable annotation has actually expanded 
and has added more transformations. So it has a string, it has equals and hash code, it has a tuple constructor, it has a map constructor, and a few other things. We can see that it does have final fields that match the definition. There is a constructor that we uh, that is auto generated. There's another constructor with map. This is a Groovy uh, capability. And then there's implementation of the string, an implementation of hash code, a new method called can equal the implementation on equals. But this is not everything. So let's move forward again into the class generation. Here's the script again. Here's our point class that now contains more code. Here's the, the two fields and some Ruby specific fields. This is part of the meta object protocol. That's part of the magic. Two constructors, the naturally third constructor, there is a two string method, there's the hash code method, can equal equals, and additional Groovy methods for the meta object protocol. Here are the getters. Unfortunately, I don't see with the default strategy the copy method. Let's go forward into finalization. Let's see if there's any difference. Uh, same content here, same constructors, two string, hash code, can equal equals getters, and that's it. So answering back the question, there is no copy method with the default generation strategy. All right, so I've got some resources for you. Uh, the, the page of the uh, Groovy project or the Groovy language is available at groovyline.org and metaprogramming has an extensive list of all the transformations. We only saw a handful of them, but this list, every single one of them coming from core and how to use them and all the properties and all the configuration that you can apply. It also has a primer for writing local and global AST transformations. And uh, it also lists uh, categories, extension methods, and a few other things. So this would be the, uh, the ideal place to get started. Or if you have any questions on how to use a specific transformation or any other runtime capabilities uh, for metaprogramming, then this is the place. The second link is a presentation by Paul King. Paul King is the current um, Apache Groovy PMC chair, so he's the one that is currently leading the project. And this particular uh, presentation has more information on how you can implement your own Groovy transformations. And finally, the two links are actually the same, just the title or the direct link. This is a history of the language system came about in 2004, if I know me mistaken. And as part of the history, it showcases how the ASD framework came to be and the many changes that the ASDs have had across the years so that we end up in where we are. Right. So everything that we have seen today uh, is open source. If you have not contributed to open source before, let me tell you, it's quite simple. You find a problem with anything that you have seen today or any other open source program, just file a ticket. That's it. You don't need to send code. If you want to, you can. If you want, you can set a test case. But at the very least, engage with the team at the other side of the project that you're using and let them know, hey, this feature is quite nice, or oh, this feature might be missing. Oh, I found a bug. Oh, this is a problem. Can you help me? Just and that, let me tell you, is is quite a lot that you can do for open source. So there's a question: When do I think this is a good time to use metaprogramming in our projects? And that's exactly a very good point because uh, Groovy four will add a new transformation that I, I think the name and the location is still in flux. But it might be this one. It's called Project. Now, when you apply this transformation and a, and a predefined set of orders like immutable to string canonical, the generated bytecode will be fully Java compatible and you will not have to have the Groovy runtime. Um, uh, the Groovy jar in your runtime. So if you go back again to inspecting the AST, yeah, oh, 
of course, it's an error because this transformation does not exist in running Ruby tree. So when I inspect the transformation here and I go into finalization, we see that this class has a reference to the Groovy land object and some other types from Groovy. But once Groovy 4 is out and this transformation is ready, if you expect the, the, trans, the Java code, well, the bytecode generated, there won't be any references to Groovy. So in a sense, you can generate Pojo classes, you can generate classes like this using Groovy code and consume it from Java without having to have the Groovy library and in the runtime. In a sense, Groovy 4 will become something like Lombok, but without all the negativity that Lombok uh, comes with. So this is all that I have for you. And uh, I hope that if you are not a Groovy developer, then at least give it a try. Yeah, Groovy code is very similar to Java code and invoking Groovy from Java and Java from, from Groovy. It's almost a two-way street. There is no impedance mismatch. There is no special bridge. Uh, the Groovy community is quite open. It's quite friendly. We have more, uh, we have close to 17 years in, in the project. So it's quite mature. We have different model, modes of operations. And of course, Groovy meta programming, uh, both the runtime and compile time uh, gives you or opens the, the, the world for new possibilities. If you have any questions uh, for the remaining time that we have, I'll be very, very happy to take them. If not, then I will thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you continue to enjoy the, uh, the conference and hopefully in the future we'll be able to see ourselves face to face.